For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got John Connors. John is the founder and CEO of Boathouse. He grew up in the advertising business, started his career at Hill Holiday, went on to serve as CEO of Zentropy Partners, an internet services business, and served as part of the McCann World Group management team. And at that time, McCann was the largest agency in the world. In 2001, he founded Boathouse. And on the show today, we talk about what Boathouse is, who they serve, and we go deep on this concept of narrative economics, which is also backed up by a Nobel Prize economist, Robert Schiller. And we talk about the contagion of narratives, how to manage narratives, how to think about how many narratives a brand might need and why this might be a better solution for many brands in the marketplace versus the ad age of brand management and philosophy that was made famous by companies like P&G. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with John Connors. Well, John, welcome to the show. Good morning, Alan. <laughs> it's going to be a good conversation. But before we get started, I hear this something about you thinking about undisclosed off the grid living. Tell me more <laughs> about what's going on there. Yeah, exactly. We all have our version of crazy. <laughs> My crazy is at 60, we're building a farm and a home up in Vermont right now, just bought 89 acres, cleared 19 and are now planning a uh, off the grid farm. And my challenge to myself is to see whether I can live off the grid in a sustainable way for one full year and then kind of get back to normal uh, <laughs> humankind. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's, um, it, it's quite the undertaking. I mean, to one, just clear that much land, <laughs> but then yeah. two, to figure out all the, the hacks and tricks to off the grid living. I've, I've watched many, too many TV shows, I think at this point on this. Stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, a little terrifying to your point, uh, especially <laughs> up there where last weekend it was minus 25. And, uh, and my wife has constantly reminded me, she's a physician, so she's quantitatively driven. And she has reminded me that I will pass away before her and then she's going to have to manage this off the grid mess that I create. So we have a lot of fun talking about that. <laughs> well, at least you've got a doctor in the house. You we know. have a doctor in the house. Exactly. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, let's talk about business. What's been your path and becoming and founding and becoming the CEO at Boathouse? Yeah, no. So I started in the business, in the agency business. I uh, started working for Hill Holiday back in 1989, right after I got out of school. And in the spirit of full disclosure, my father was the one of the founders. So if you recall, it was Hill Holiday Connors Cosmopolis. And uh, he was one of the four founders and the last founder remaining. So I worked for him in Boston, New York. And then he sold in 97 to Interpublic. And I went down to work at uh, McCann Erickson. So I went from mm. the biggest firm in New England, where I sort of lived the nepotism model, <laughs> to the biggest firm in the world and flying all over. I was running the internet services group for McCann. And it was, it was a pretty wild, interesting time because I was 30 running this internet services company and sitting on the board of McCann World Group, hanging out with all 60-year-olds because there were no 60-year-olds to run the internet group. So <laughs> I, it was like that movie, A Christmas Carol. I got to see what my future would look like if I stayed there for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then in 2001, with that in mind, when the dot-com bust happened, I headed home to start my own. I didn't want to be part of I'd seen this biggest in New England, one of the big ones in the country, seen the biggest in the world and kind of wanted to start a BS free environment and came home to start my own. That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit more about Boathouse. Like what, how do you define what you guys do and, and, and who do you serve today? Yeah. So I think incredibly idealistic, like a lot of entrepreneurs and founders, we built the business based on the types of companies that sort of uh, lead the Massachusetts economy. For, so financial services, healthcare, higher ed, those types of institutions. And mm -hmm. I think we built it around the, sort of the portfolio model, our ability to sort of deliver all asset classes, if you will. So mm -hmm. we sell advertising, digital acquisition, search, those types of things. Uh, we sell social and we sell comms. And the unique part is it's one P&L. I'd grown up in, multi, in vertical P&L agencies where yeah. everybody protected their their asset class and didn't sort of contribute to the overall performance. 
And so we very deliberately built the model in order to drive overall performance. So we move clients between asset classes really frequently. We think of ourselves as portfolio managers that are driving overall performance. And so incredibly idealistic, incredibly sort of unselfish in how we drive it. Right. Right. Interesting. Well, and you, I think you guys, you've got a location in Boston. I think there's something here in the DC market as well. Are there other locations you guys are in as well? Yeah. To your point, pre-COVID, we were majority Boston based and served clients mm-hmm. out sort of uh, in the classic Northeast footprint. Right. I think when the world went remote, we took advantage of that opportunity. And one, our staff started to become much more remote. So now 25% of our staff is not Massachusetts based. And then two, we took the opportunity to place an office in Northern California and an office in DC, markets that sort of behave a lot like the Boston market, high intellectual capital, high knowledge economy markets, Mm -hmm. where our base of clients and our base of and our case studies and our work were relevant. Now we'll open something in either Florida and Texas later in this year. And so it's been this incredibly successful model just to start scaling our model on a national basis rather than just on a regional basis. Yeah. Well, and in, in the types of clients you mentioned, financial services, healthcare, higher ed, there's definitely a lot of those in all of those locations. Exactly. And they, to your point, Alan, they behave very differently from CPG type clients, right? Yeah. And in CPG firms, the marketer, the marketing team is usually at the center of the universe. In a financial services firm, the brokers are in a hospital, the docs and nurses are in an educational institution, the faculty and the students are. So they just tend to behave a little different and they require a little sort of different nuance. And that's, that complexity is what we've kind of embraced and focused on. Yeah, it's definitely, I think of it in terms of, it's almost like a collection of influencers. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> to exactly use, right. You know, there's doctors or professors or the advisors, the brokers, et cetera, that you talked about. Because they're, they're the, the attraction many times. I mean, of course, there's brands for exactly. you know, universities and hospitals but, and financial services companies, but you really have that affiliation and that attraction to your local, your human (laughs) on the other side of the conversation. And they're super high IQ, right? So when you're sitting there with a collection of MIT professors or Harvard Business School professors and navigating brand strategy and marketing strategy or a set of cardiac surgeons or, or right, they're just so high IQ that they want to challenge everything. Um, And so you have to have a model that enables and allows that discussion rather than shuts down that discussion. Yeah. My, I grew up when my mom was in the healthcare field, like x-ray technician. Uh, yeah. And she used to talk about doctors in a loving way, but she <laughs> said, yeah, the God complex is real. Oh, um, it is. <laughs> so, and yeah. you, you have a wife that's a physician, so good luck. And I but, live uh, with one, but the, yeah. <laughs> the good news is she's the academic dean at home, so I don't have to try and cover the, you know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. Well, um, the last time we spoke, you talked about this concept of narrative economics. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about this, both for listeners and also just for me, and like why that's important and how it fits into what you're doing. So narrative economics is a concept introduced in 2017 by Robert Chill, the Nobel Prize economist. And we stumbled on it when we were searching. So what to the previous part of the conversation, when we were talking about complex industries and institutions and not kind of classic package goods. We've been on the search for brand models, strategy models that aren't purely brand management driven, right? So as you Mm -hmm. know, brand management was started in the 30s by a marketer at P&G when they were differentiating between ivory and came soap. And they, he created a manifesto type document that sort of was the precursor to modern brand theory. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great model, but the U.S. economy is no longer a manufacturing product-driven economy. It's a services-driven economy, as you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we started looking for service models. And when we stumbled on narrative economics in our search, we were sort of down the rabbit hole with the economist Thaler. And I know we're fellow geeks here, so we can geek out on this a second. <laughs> yeah. But the, we were studying behavioral economics. And what Schiller had put forth was this concept of narrative economics. And the foundation of it was that because every piece of content in the world has now been indexed by the likes of Google, what he was able to do was it previously economists could only leverage economic data, you know, Mm -hmm. GDP data and jobs data, unemployment data, that kind of data. What he was able to do with tools like Google Ngram was actually go back and look at narratives like the American dream and, and sort of evaluate 
how those narratives move the economic indicators and create some causality and correlation between those two things. And so that put us on this track of maybe we ought to be thinking about client narratives in addition to client brand, right? Mm -hmm. And it really started to have us. So then we did two things. We went on the search for AI tools that could help us start the strategy process. And as you know, there's so much energy and enthusiasm around the creative tools on AI, Mm -hmm. not nearly as much in our opinion as should be on the strategy tools because there's incredible sort of opportunity there. But we then sort of landed on two firms. One is called NetBase Quid. The other is Signal AI. And we dug in on those two tools. And what they give us the ability to do is quantify narratives on companies and then sort of help companies fix, right? So Mm. as you can imagine, everybody's got their digital transformation or transformation strategy. We can hold up the narrative mirror and see whether they're even close to achieving that in the market and then recommend fixes off of that portfolio model in order to fix it. So it's just, it's an incredible new model, incredible new data set that allows us to think about brand a whole different way. No, I mean, it's it's really tr- kind of fascinating, frankly. And uh, one of the things that makes me think about is um, I've had way back, I don't even know what number episode, I had Phil Kotler, you know, yeah. the, uh, the kind of father of <laughs> modern marketing uh, from years ago, uh, kind of uh, along the same lines of your, you know, the notion of P&G and the brand management philosophy. And he's an economist by training. And we had this interesting conversation that like economists are constantly trying to predict through economic data, actual human behavior. <laughs> yes. And so it's, it's really a, a social science at the end of the day, even though most people that are kind of novices to it, they think it's a you know, hard science. And this is really interesting because you're basically finding a better data source, like a truer indication of what humans are doing that then are the precursor for the economic data that everyone's been studying. That's exactly right. And we've all heard the term animal spirits, and Schiller talks about it in the book, Mm -hmm. that Keynesian sort of animal spirit models were always knew something was happening, but they didn't really have language for it. And so what Schiller essentially is doing is putting this word narrative and using new data sets to sort of describe what the animal spirits are, how the markets created momentum. And what's, again, so incredibly powerful is we can now walk into a room A CEO tells us what they're all about and what they stand for and what their strategy is. And then we just hold up every piece of social and news data in the market, every piece, and say, how about this, right? And (laughs) this is who you are in the market. And as we all know, as marketers, boards and CEOs and leadership teams tend to disregard our qualitative and quantitative research too often Mm -hmm. because they have an issue about the sample or they poke a hole in it some way, shape or how. But when we take every piece of news and every piece of social, it's hard for them to ignore that as actually their true narrative. Uh, I love it. I love it. Truth serum. <laughs> it is. Yeah. No, it's like mirror, mirror on the wall. You know, exactly. it, it is truth serum or yeah. uh, Snow White. It's that kind of simplicity with which, but the power behind the data and the tools is incredible. Yeah. Well, so how, as you think about this, I mean, obviously you're using these tools to infect change or affect change. How does this then shift your focus around marketing? And um, how do you think about influencing the narrative? So I want to, I don't want to lose your thought of infect and affect change. uh, Because (laughs) as you probably know, Schiller talks a lot about contagion and of narratives. And he was talking about contagion before COVID. But (laughs) there's a lot we should come back to that. But so the thing we first did with the narrative tools before we actually sort of applied them to clients, was we went back and actually looked at brands and institutions through the narrative lens, right? So we actually Mm -hmm. studied the Catholic Church, we studied Tesla, we studied Apple, we studied, part of the reason we studied religion was because, and countries, was because those narratives actually began before 1930, when brand was introduced in 30. We wanted to see people who had built brands before 1930, and this really interesting sort of layer emerged, which was most institutions, countries, and and sort of those leading brands have five to seven core narratives that actually are driving in the market, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think everyone likes to talk about Tesla, there's five brands that every CEO admires. So we, Tesla was one of them. So there's a colonized Mars narrative. There's a product narrative. There's a 
self-driving feature narrative. Um, there's a fan narrative. There's a manufacturing narrative when Wall Street said they couldn't produce enough cars. There's, mm. and they defended against that. There's a supercharger narrative and there's an Elon Musk narrative, right? Mm. And so what's become so powerful is we're walking into organizations now and saying, don't be so monolithic in one brand position and one idea. We're actually walking in and sort of, we still have an umbrella idea, but we're connecting it to five to seven narratives. And what those narratives allow us to do, we're much more relevant with the C-suite and the board right out of the gate, as opposed to going in and banging our fist about brand. Right. It also gives us the ability executionally to sort of news jack and social jack five different sets of narratives to drive media and, and social impression volume, yeah. right? So now... If the market's moving towards, wants to talk about the man, we can talk about Elon Musk. If it wants to talk about supercharge, if it wants to talk about manufacturing. So we're not, we're able to drive impression volume at much higher scale and much more rapidly than if we're just hammering one benefit over and over. Wow. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it does bring back the notion of infect, <laughs> infect change. Um, and some The part to that that I think is going to be so sexy, we're not there yet, but we're teetering on it. Mm. is actually so if you can imagine now we identify the five to seven narratives then you can actually to me strategically now we know we have the right focus right so yeah. now we know where and now when we bring in ai tools downstream we can actually be watching whether which narratives are actually gaining traction and which narratives are declining right mm. yeah. and so we can generate volume using ai tools at a high level and we can test them in the market using media AI at a high level. And now our ability to move in and out of narratives, again, this got used poorly in political campaigns historically. We will not be using it poorly. But right. the, uh, so that ability to actually monitor what has high contagion and what doesn't becomes sort of you can see how this gets built out as we kind of. But what's so yeah. crazy to me is everyone's starting the AI conversation down at the execution level not at the strategy level, right? And, right? and it's a little bit like leaving the coast of England with the wrong compass reading. You know, like <laughs> you, can, you can execute AI all you want, but if it's crap, it's crap, right? right. Uh, if you're not on the right narratives. So that's the part why we're so heavily invested in getting the strategy part right and then making sure we build out the media and the creative layer second. Yeah, I mean, it, I totally agree with you. Like the application of AI we're applying it like a manufacturing philosophy, yes, right? Like exactly. how can we make more widgets faster and yeah. without human intervention yeah. uh, versus how do we leverage the limitation that we have? And this is kind of funny. Maybe it says something about human behavior, but like the recognition of our limitations, which is our computing ability in our brain <laughs> and how do we harness AI to augment our ability to compute more information? That's... Um, I'm going to steal your manufacturing <laughs> philosophy line because that, that is absolutely where the world is now. And, and the other thing with our own marketing that we've been messing around with a little bit is kind of that exact point is, so your second point was the AI plus the HI, you know, like how do you mm -hmm. connect, yeah. how do you use the AI to drive the human intelligence piece and leverage all of our collective experience here and our strategy abilities and all that rather than like just do the manufacturing component to your right. words. Well, if you find a good, I mean, you've probably had these conversations with data scientists in the past, but if you find a really good one or even a really good statistician for that matter, yeah. they will tell you that you have to apply logic to the analysis, pre-analysis. You can't just analyze, assume that you can crank numbers and something magically is going to pop out that makes sense. You have to kind of apply that intuition of like, what am I trying to answer? What qu and the framing of that question or that search can determine whether you get it right or wrong. <laughs> Many oh. times I had a stats professor, I remember, and I think it was um, business school. And they said, you know, statistics is really just lying with numbers. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's always stuck with me because it's like, yeah, I get it. Like you, you totally could just make up a narrative and look for the right data, but you've got to make sure it's there or uh, make up a question and look for the right data. But it's, it's a, an art and a science together. Yeah. Um, you know, the human no, you're, and the tech. you're right. And if we, if we manipulate the data early to your point, because it is very, it is easy to manipulate it if you wanted to. Yeah. All that happens is because we get paid for strategy and execution. 
Right. Unlike a consultant that just gets paid for strategy <laughs> or an agency that too often just gets paid for execution. Yeah. The if we were to manipulate the data, all it's going to do is spoil the execution. Oh yeah. You're put a you're bullet worse. in us anyway. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. um, so we it's just going to be more have, painful. Yeah. Exactly. That's where we just have to have that sense of idealism and purpose on the data collection. Otherwise, mm-hmm. our whole model is hold clients for a long time. Don't. We're not trying to churn clients, so it's not about one year kind of thing. It's about 10 years. Yeah, no, it makes sense. makes sense. And like as you you describe kind of a little bit about how narrative economics looks in practice, you're, you know, essentially define these like five to seven core narratives. You're monitoring them in terms of which, which ones are taking off, which ones are declining. Does it then boil into, and, and narratives, I imagine, to your, I think your point you're just making, which is they have probably a long life cycle. I would guess. Totally. So what we do is we sort of, first thing we do is reflect the strategy of the company, capture it on a page, right? Mm -hmm. And then then we just look at the the greatest opportunities and the greatest threats to that strategy, not a very sophisticated model, but but the discipline of doing it, right? Yeah. And then we let the sub-narrative drop out of that because now to the Tesla example, the manufacturer, they created a manufacturing narrative because of Wall Street attacking them, saying they couldn't produce cars fast enough, right? Mm, and right. so they started having carnivals in front of their factories in Berlin and Shanghai <laughs> because as a way to give Wall Street the finger, right? And, right? and it's right there in their investor relations decks. So a lot of times we'll use narratives to, as defensive strategies and or narratives as offensive strategies to take advantage of opportunities, right? So mm-hmm. they can be used both ways re- in a creative way. And then we talk a lot about, you know, like I said, we studied Tesla versus the Catholic Church. And mm-hmm. we looked at, you know, Elon Musk is about 90% of Tesla's narrative. The Pope is about 66% of the Catholic <laughs> Church's narrative, right? right? And you get to see how both of them use artifacts, right? Yeah. In different ways, Bibles and Ten Commandments versus superchargers and Mars rockets, right? So right. it becomes, it's visual candy as well as kind of, strategic as well as kind of copy Mm -hmm. yeah 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 well uh so i mean this is fascinating we could probably go on for days just talking about narrative economy economic and narratives in practice but like i'm curious as we kind of like pull up or pull out a little bit like how does this relate to the role of the head of marketing and the cmo or the the role of, of that job in itself if you will yeah so I think it all ties back to the CMO, right? Because ultimately the CMO is our customer. Mm-hmm. And we have to be thinking about the CMO's livelihood first and foremost, because if if they don't survive, we don't survive, right? And mm-hmm. so everything is in the spirit of the CMO. And I think our biggest, strategically, our biggest observation is everybody likes to talk about the fact that age, the agency model is in decline, right? And people are bringing stuff inside and all that. But I don't think there's sort of necessarily always enough discussion about what's happening to CMOs in the market, right? Their, mm-hmm. their tenure is the lowest it's been in 15, 20 years. And they're not being respected at the, by the CEO and the C-suite the way they were historically. Google data suggests they're only invited to about a third of the board meetings, right? Mm-hmm. And so if our client, the CMO, is not respected, then it means we, the agency for that CMO, are not respected. So the data is massively important, in our opinion, for the CMO because for the first time now, the CMO can walk back into the C-suite, into the boardroom with a completely new data set that makes them more important, right? Mm-hmm. And so the, in the old days, the CMO controlled the four Ps, right? Pricing, yeah. product, promotion, and place distribution. Place. Mm-hmm. Now, too often, they only control communication, right? Or mm-hmm. just the marketing spend. What the narrative data allows is it actually scrapes glass door so it we see whether the employees are happy or not it sees it can scrape google reviews so we see whether the product is doing well or not right or people are complaining about pricing so we can scrape wall street data and see whether the analysts are happy so the interesting piece now is the cmo we sort of return power to the cmo seat right and that's the magic right so now our client gets more important it brings us up the ladder strategically, creatively, media-wise, and it really does create win-win models. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And I mean, as I, I'm reflecting a little bit back on the industries and sectors you serve as well, and that notion of the people element 
your narratives can get out of control very fast when you've got yeah. decentralized brand nuggets, if you will. I call it brand nuggets are the people walking around, right? Yeah. And this definitely puts you back in the driver's seat because otherwise you're in this, this intermediated environment where you, you really, at the end of the day, it's not about a control of those folks, but it's trying to drive consistency and alignment. And this gives you a mechanism to measure that, whether it's true or not. No, that's right. And, and I think two examples to your point. One is, again, the tools, what's cool about them is we can look anywhere from the, the date range on them is 27 months back mm -hmm. to the last hour, right? Yeah. And so when we have clients who are in crisis mode, we can be watching trend lines in the last hour. It's usually not that useful, but we're usually watching in, in unit of days. Mm -hmm. And so we can watch if someone in the team or the model goes off the rails a little bit or something negative happens, we can watch whether that story is increasing or declining. The other really powerful usage, I kind of call it the, the fantasy football of social, <laughs> is we can now, a lot of brands in financial services, healthcare, higher ed, aren't sort of inherently interesting. They just don't have sort of inherent sexiness to them and, and social energy. But we can manufacture relevance for them by using the tools to monitor everything that's going on culturally related to health or related to education. And then we can actually newsjack or social jack those conversations in order to drive impression volume and re relevancy for the brand, right? So just like fantasy football teams was manufacturing relevance for, right. we can do the same with news and social now, again, leveraging the tool. So we can do crisis, we can do sort of big social pushes. It's again, all from that data. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, one of the things I like to do on this show is just get to know you a little bit better. We know you've got this off the grid plan. Yeah. But even beyond that, I love asking everyone that comes on the show this question of what experience of your past defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah, no, I think it's not sort of the happiest of stories, but it was definitely sort of the moment that most defined me. So at 24, my cousin and closest friend passed away from leukemia. Mm -hmm. And he was coming out of his third round of chemo. And we were down in Atlanta where he lived. And he woke up and he couldn't see, right? And so right. I had to carry him out of the room, carry him to the car, carry him to the hospital where he passed away that day. And I think everybody goes through some kind of hardship that just turns their, makes the rest of their life, right? Different. And I think at that moment, I appreciated what really matters and the importance of family, the importance of close friends and what doesn't matter, right? Sort mm -hmm. of the BS that so many people get so entangled in. And so I made a promise to him that day that, uh, that I wouldn't screw around, that I would look right. out for what matters. And, yeah. and that's what I've done. I love that. Love that. Thanks for sharing that. Probably oh, isn't the, the oh. happiest of memory, but no, it's, uh, but it's, it's always there for me, you know, like, and it's, yeah. again, so that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, what, what advice would you give your younger self if you were starting this journey all over again? I think for me, I think young people, myself, we all tend to follow um, our mentors and our, and the icons mm -hmm. that we, a little too much, right? So growing <laughs> up in a business that my father started, I spent a lot of years early on trying to model him versus right. modeling myself, right? And then when I went to the global agencies, I did a little bit of the same in the first half of that experience and then broke out of that in the second half, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the piece was, I think my style was my style from very early, you know, to the extent mm -hmm. that not, we don't change that much from high school kind of thing. Right. And I think it's a little cliche, but just appreciating that, not sort of chasing other stars, but leaning into that core DNA is the magic. And I think we do stuff now to try and help young people in the company identify their strengths really early so they don't spend time chasing somebody else's strengths. They chase their own and can really build on those. And that's, so that's how I'd push it. Well, uh, we may have already answered this question, but I'll ask it anyway. What one topic do you think marketers need to be learning more about, or maybe you're trying to learn more about yourself? Yeah, no, I think you're right. We've covered it. I mean, I think the strategy AI piece and I would just challenge every marketer to think about why and how they embrace brand management, right? So yeah. again, it's a singular theory and is it right for everything, right? So like, yeah. again, 
And maybe it is because in some situations it is, but maybe it's not right. And have they right. really evaluated why they pray to that God versus another? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's very, very true. Well, are there brands or companies or causes that you kind of personally follow or you think other people should take notice of? Again, I, I'm following those, like I said, the institutions and those top five mm-hmm. brands. I think the other part of that, because they, they're so relevant to CEOs, right. the other piece is, for me, I think too many marketers follow those companies only, right? And yeah. I think the top 30 brands all spend over a billion dollars a year. <laughs> and right. most of us don't have a billion to spend. And so back to my religious bent, I, the false God thing, I think right. the industry and the category and the creatives and the strategy people all tend to index to those 30. And if you had a billion dollars, you can screw up a lot of things and nobody notices, right? right but if right. you have 5 million, 10 million, 25 million to spend for a client, in some ways you almost have to be more disciplined. And so we spend a lot of time really sort of studying companies at both ends of the spectrum so that we don't get overly influenced by the bright, shiny object. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think obviously AI is a, is mm-hmm. a massive opportunity when combined with that, uh, to your word, logic. Um, yeah. So I think that's one. Um, I think the second piece to me is really paying attention to their role in the C-suite. Mm-hmm. I think what we see repeatedly is too many marketers tend to bring in a brand management philosophy and preach brand in the C-suite. And as a result, the CEO is dealing with so many different stakeholders and audiences that when you come in and talk brand or it's all about the consumer, you almost seem disconnected right from the beginning, right? right. And not enough time is spent in classic relationship building with CEOs and making sure the CEO knows you have their back versus just banging on the table about brand, right? And, yeah. and so we try, and that's where those narrative tools again help the, but again, just any way, shape, or form to get CMOs to think more disciplined about their relationship build and then to use data, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I worry most about is that the short-termism of CMOs becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and CMOs walk in trying to get sort of grab wins really quick so that knowing that they're going to be out in three years, two and a half, three years, and that they're not actually thinking enough about doing the hard work and then that makes the whole relationship between CMO and the C-suite more transactional. And I think that's bad for everyone. Yeah, 100% agree. And it, I'll just leave it there. I think, I, think, I think you said it all. John, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been truly enlightening conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone listening will, will agree. No, it's great talking to you. And I love, the, I love going back and forth. Like I said, I'm going to steal some of your lines. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.